My name is Cade Courtley, and this is Can You Survive This Podcast. The show is designed to teach you techniques that will increase your chances of survival if you happen to find yourself or your family in any life-threatening disaster scenario imaginable. Each episode will put you smack in the middle of a new disaster scenario as I challenge my guests to see if they have what it takes to get out alive. Knowledge is power, people. Can you survive this podcast? My fellow survivors, if you can hear my voice, then it means you're still alive, and it is my continued mission to keep it that way. I'm Cade Courtley. Welcome to Can You Survive This Podcast. Um, Special guest today, awesome guy, hero, fellow teammate. Um, This individual uh, served for over 16 years, during which time he was involved in approximately 400 plus missions. Um, he was a Navy SEAL. He was part of Operation Red Wings, Marcus Luttrell. He was part of the Captain Phillips Somali pirate situation. And as a side note, uh, he had something to do with uh, killing bin Laden. So uh, anybody who doesn't know about that operation, Rob O'Neill was a guy who was on point and pulled the trigger and created pink spray where it needed to be created. So Rob, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having, let's say, thank you for shooting straight and uh, appreciate you being here, buddy. Okay. It's good to see you, man. Um, thanks for having me here. This is a, it's a cool podcast. I'm glad to be a part of it. Great to talk to you. And whenever two team guys get together, start shooting the shit, some good stuff comes out of it. So I'm excited. You grew up in uh, Butte, Montana, right? Yeah, from Butte, Montana, which uh, has some of the some of the best summer weather, some of the worst winter weather. But it's nice to grow up there, uh, small town. Um, you know, just getting to know normal people, uh, get good at outdoor stuff, a lot of skiing, a lot of hunting, a lot of fishing. Really, mm-hmm. really good trout. And uh, yeah, it's, Butte's, a good, Butte's a great spot. It has some some really good food. They don't even realize that. You know, they, that's the home of the pork chop sandwich, which I don't know. I don't know. People try it other places. It's not the same as up there. And you got like things called pasties that are just invented by miners. We're a big mining town uh, mm-hmm. that they could eat, you know, a mile underground, these meat pies. And then uh, Great Steakhouse is obviously beef there. And um, yeah, wonderful place. Did uh, you talked about it, but growing up there, I grew up in Colorado and I think we had a very similar upbringing. It was a lot of fishing, hunting. I learned oh, yeah. how to drive when I was seven. I think when yeah. did you get, was your your first rifle a twenty two? Short first time I was 22, but we didn't start hunting until I was, uh, yeah, about 12. So I had to start hunting with uh, lever action 30-30. With oh, Hulk. was it a Marlin? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, actually. That's exactly what my first hunting rifle was. I got uh, <laughs> God, I got an elk when I was 14. It was so funny. I, I was so excited. I shot the hoof off. I shot its jaw. I think I hit it in the tail. It, it was a mess. I was just like all over yeah, the place. The, the first elk, though, because elk are like, they're like um, my, my, mythic creatures. Like you, you don't, you're not going to see them. Elk are hard to get. You know, like the really great hunters that that have gotten them, but they're the, you know, like your badass uncle or whatever. It's like never going to be me. But the first time you see an elk, like just the adrenaline. The the there's one. Here's my chance. Don't screw this up. Don't fuck up. Don't miss the shot. Um, yeah, my first elk I got in Gardner, Montana, when I was 15 years old, and uh, just, just incredible to see see the animals. And you know, and you get better at it, better at it, start realizing. If you're not lazy, you can you can do really well. But to, to me, hunting was the most important thing in life. Hunting and then basketball season, then hunt, you know, they kind of coincided. How did that background and that foundation when you were younger, how do you think that helped you in the SEAL teams? It helped me during um, land warfare and mountain warfare because I was good at recognizing um, stuff at night. Because when we when we got really good at hunting elk, we get that we realized if you got to start hiking hiking the hill. Um, in a certain amount of the right, the wind in the right direction, getting to a spot, you're not going to chase the elk down. You need to be in a spot where the elk are going to be. So I got really good at, at navigating. Um, uh, I got good at, and, and you were a land warfare guy. Um, when you realize how, when I start walking or skiing, um, I want to, ha- I want to be cold because I don't want to sweat. And if I put all my shit on and start moving, I'm going to overheat and then you can't do that. So, you know, I learned about, you know, you can, you can hike in your, in your boots, your, your whatever pants and it's a silk top. And you're going to be cold, but once you get the blood pump and you're good, and as soon as you stop, you know, put the warm stuff back on, and then and then you're, you're waiting in a park for these elk, maybe a couple hours, and you never know when they're going to come up. So it's sort of like setting an ambush, and you learn the little tricks of how 
just sit there and entertain yourself because you don't want to pull out the cigar because it stinks. Obviously, you can have Copenhagen because you're supposed to. But <laughs> but um, um, just just how to how to do the mind games, how to how to know. It's not even looking. Boom. <laughs> I gotta quit even, one of these uh, days. It's not even um, looking for is that th there. It's you're looking for what doesn't belong. Yeah. And that's when the, like you, the excitement of you start seeing the cow elk come out in the in the in the in the park, and then you know that the bulls are going to be in the back because I don't know why they'll just, they'll sacrifice the other ones. And once the cows start coming in a couple spikes, and then if there's a big bull in the herd, he'll be a 20 meters behind him. So just wait, even if you have a cow tech, don't take your shot until the bull comes out. So I just learned a little patience, a lot of navigation, knowing where to go, how to not get lost. Um, you know, and obviously I probably got lost, but it just, yeah, it helped out a lot. So. Well, it just, it felt like it was such a great advantage. You always heard about guys that showed up still training, like they'd never seen the ocean before. And you're like, yes. mm -hmm. are you freaking kidding me? But having all those skills and learn that ahead of time, I felt was really an advantage getting into the teams because, you know, everybody else has to learn it for the first time or some of those guys did. Mm -hmm. You yeah. showed up and you kind of had a familiarity and you knew what you were doing. I, th mm -hmm. I thought it was really helpful. And just, just studying a little bit about ballistics, knowing how to sight in a gun, how to, how to maintain your breathing. A lot of people, you know, I was never – um like a, a, a competitive shooter, but sighting in, you know, <laughs> the 30, 30, then my 30 out six, then my 300 way mag eventually as, as time went on that uh, just reading about ballistics and, and, you know, realizing that someone a lot smarter than me figured out the wind calculation. So I won't get that in depth. I'll just trust them for the wind couch, but right. you know, the 25 zero and versus the, the 200 zero, whatever you want to do, just a lot of stuff that helped me. I wasn't nervous with a gun. So it, yeah, the third phase on, you know, through sniper school at SEAL team two, it was, it was a total, total advantage. You and I came in about the same time. I think you were class 208, right? Bud's yes, 208? Right. Okay, I was 202. So we had maybe a, a separation of about a year. But yeah. wh why the SEAL teams? Because when we got in, there weren't a dozen movies and two dozen books. I, the only thing I remember when I decided I wanted to get into SEALs, it was that really, really bad Charlie Sheen movie. I love and, that movie. <laughs> well, it's, it's likable, but it's bad. <laughs> well, the ready room was in that. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. where they went to celebrate the chief's death, which, by the way, should never happen. That J.O. should have been smacked around for getting his chief killed. Absolutely. But, you know, we can get into that later. But, uh, um, I, no, the movie's fun because, uh, well, oh, so the, the the stuntman that did the famous jump, Charlie Braun. Or not Charlie Braun, uh, uh, Eddie Braun, sorry. That Eddie Braun has been Charlie Sheen's stuntman forever. And, and he's actually, they're both friends of mine now. And it's funny, when uh, Eddie did the jump, um, he said, all right, we're doing one take. I'm doing this one time because I mean that was a gnarly jump. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't the reason I joined, but it was part of the reason I eventually signed because I I went to join the Marine Corps um, on a whim, and the Marine recruiter was literally out to lunch. He probably went across <laughs> the street, but the Navy guy was in in his office, and and I walked in there to ask him where the Marine was. He's going to know where the Marine is, and he he asked me why I wanted to um, why I wanted to join the Navy, and I, I said I want to be a sniper, and he said look no further, we have snipers and. We have, I want to be, we have snipers in the Navy. And he said, you got to be a SEAL first. Um, but if you make it through, we'll send you to sniper school. Not realizing he had nothing to do with that. He just wanted to get me in the Navy. Uh, I, I hadn't, I didn't, I was one of those guys, I'd seen the ocean, but I didn't know how to swim. And uh, he just, he talked me to the delayed entry program. I knew I had a pool at the, at Montana Tech in Butte, Montana, where I, I actually still had my student ID. I was playing basketball there and I could go swim for five months. And me being just that naive 19 year old, five months of swimming training, that would be enough sure. for uh, what I'm yeah. about to go with. And, but that, that was one of those positions, I think, where I I, I didn't have bad habits yet. So uh, I kind of learned the drown proofing there, like we all did, that hopefully no one has the experience of getting tied up and thrown in the water. Right. But um, having not having bad habits, I was sort of able to learn the correct stroke, sort of there, even though I, I don't think that even in the teams, they don't teach swimming lessons enough. <laughs> but uh yeah, it was kind of an accident, but uh, you know, it was it was a positive attitude. I I I they did show me the recruiting tapes. I knew how hard SEAL training would be, but you know, I figured, Hey, I, I get a, I get a free trip to Coronado. I know where they live on the beach. And if I don't make it, I'll go to a ship and have four years of sea stories and go back home to Butte. It's going to be, it's going to be an adventure regardless. That's kind of how it worked out for me. Rob, do you realize the fact that this guy decided to go to lunch, change the course of your life? Isn't that crazy? It's <laughs> wild. I mean, I was going to ask you this question a little later, but I'll hit you now. Do you believe in luck, fate? Do you believe in karma? something else a combination I kind of, of all that i kind of believe in, in karma but most importantly i believe in a positive attitude and i believe that life happens around you 
while you're planning. It really doesn't matter what you're planning. Something else is probably going to happen. A prime example is right now, like a couple months ago, we're talking about the Democratic primary and Elizabeth Warren and, and, and Joe Biden and, and, and um, Bernie Sanders. And then we get hit on a Thursday night by a pandemic it's like out of nowhere. Um, so, I mean, the, if, if I would have joined the Marine Corps, it would definitely been a, been a completely different um, a completely different turnout for me. But I mean, even the decisions to, um, you know, I got SEAL Team 2 because, you know, after Budget do the dream sheet. And all I knew is I wanted the, the I wanted the East Coast mm -hmm. because the only game in town was Bosnia. So I want to do that. Um, so I, I, I put two, eight and four, knowing that if I put I knew two things about the dream sheet is you're, if you put the coast, you'll probably get it. But if you put SDV, you're getting it, period. Oh, you're screwed. Yeah. Don't even do it. Even instructors saying don't, just, just yeah. stay away from it. Don't even mention it. And I got SEAL Team 2. And if I, if I hadn't gotten SEAL Team 2 and got like SEAL Team 5, I might not have ended up at SEAL Team 6 eventually. Maybe, I mean, maybe I would have uh, gotten out and lived in Coronado and ended up growing weed. I, I don't know. Um, but uh, but just because of the chain of events that happened that, because at SEAL Team 2, I, I, I mean, the guy at SEAL Team 2, once, once my four years was up, I was like, I cannot leave this place. This is too much fun. And then re-enlisted and ran into a dude from Damnick. And I'm like, well, and I wouldn't have seen him if I was in Coronado. I'm like, well, what's it? Why is he so arrogant? I'm going over there. And, and then it's just right place, right time. Don't, you know, always avoid the negativity. Never lose your sense of humor. And good, you know, bad things will happen, but get over and learn from them and quit dwelling on them and keep going. That's, I mean, it's all, it's all a chain reaction of, and a lot of karma. I mean, it's going to, it's going to get back to you too. So we'll see. Yeah. I mean, I remember my first platoon chief. I, I did the same thing coming out of buzz. I was like, I need, I need to get to the East coast. I want to be at two. Like you said, that yeah. was the only game in town at the time. Got a chance to get over to Bosnia through two. We're in Alaska doing cold weather training. It was a cold weather platoon team one yeah. or team two. Sorry. Yeah. And, uh, so we're in and we got the weekend off. So we go to Chilkoot Charlie's. It's like mm -hmm. the, the biggest bar in Anchorage. I know so all about that. We're in Chilkoot Charlie's, two platoons. And so we're standing on one side of the bar, and then all the local roughnecks, the loggers, and you name it, are on the yeah. other side. And you can just feel the tension. It's coming. It's coming. Everybody, we start taking our watches off, putting them in our pockets, because it's getting ready to be knuckle junction, without <laughs> a doubt. And Shipley, who was one of the instructors on the, chi on the trip, he stands up and he says to the other side of the bar, Who's the toughest motherfucker in here? And we're all like, oh, shit. Oh, boy. Yeah. Here we go. And he says it again. And a guy across the bar stands up and keeps standing up. The guy was like <laughs> six, six. And he goes, I am. And Shipley, being Shipley, he goes, will you take over? Because I got to go take a piss. And it just... Everything was like, yeah, buying drinks for everybody. Yeah, we're hugging. Just, yeah, he, he it was a classic Shipley. He just... Problem solved. Yeah, yeah, he literally won it with his mind. The yeah. guy's just a smart dude. Yeah, the first time I met him at, uh, you know, checking into Team 2, I went into the training office, uh, fresh out of Buds. I don't know what, you fly on the wall, scared shit. I was scared of Buds, and if you if you if you say you weren't, you're probably lying, but I'm scared checking the SEAL Team 2. Hell yeah. I, I look around like uh, just these legendary dudes are there. Uh, Neil Roberts is in the room, and uh, Shipley came out. And he's got his khakis on and just a full rack. And he goes, well, this sucks. Who wants to go to the Chiefs club and get a beer? It's like <laughs> nine in the morning. I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> he is kind of a legend both in the teams and after and the teams. I, yeah, he's, and he's, he's been uh, just – he's an awesome dude. And yeah. I love his sight. His sense of humor is one where – should I laugh or be terrified? Because I'm not sure where this is coming from. He's just Yeah, awesome. he should either be doing stand-up comedy or on a lot of watch lists. Maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to well, me about sniper school. I thought that was, for me, that was probably the most challenging thing I ever was, did. I and also was, the most rewarding thing. Uh, good old uh, Camp Atterbury. Did you have Dave Johnson or were you Bezik? Bezik. Okay. So Chief Bezik was there for us. And another great guy, too. He was, uh, he just, uh, just, uh, yeah. Just a, it's at some level, they just get the sense of humor that, that, that you get taught in the teams. I think you, at first it's intimidating, but then you learn how to tell a joke. You learn how to be sarcastic, a uh, self-deprecating humor. And, uh, uh, but we had music and it was, I, I think that was, a that was a really, really hard course just because of how, how, um, complex everything is. Again, the, you know, the wind calculation, the, the being a spotter, because pulling the trigger is easy when you know where to put the hair, the, the crosshairs and the mill dots. It's, it's the guy at an unknown distance over 800, uh, 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 meters, how the wind, how to read it, and all that stuff, and you're doing the test. The pressure of if I screw this test up, he's going to fail, not me, but it's on me to make the call. 
and then the the famous long runs that we take the really fast far runs and then uh and even the kim's game the keep in memory game where uh-huh. which starts off as here's 10 objects on your desk two adjectives and then a na- two adjectives and a noun to describe it and you got to remember it and then write them all down but then right. they get into like they take you out before a long day at the range hey look on the roof here's all this stuff just check it out for a minute then you go to the range all day you come back oh by the way those 10 things write this down. it's like god damn it um, but the, the stocks, people don't realize how hard the stock is because it's, it's not as simple as wearing a ghillie suit and jumping into bushes. You need to realize what is, what does 30 yards behind me look like? And how do I look like that? And put, put layers up so that when they look through their two dimensional shit that they only see this, and they can't see the gun and really hard course. I, I, you know, I got stressed out there a lot and that's kind of a stressful course, but getting through that and becoming a sniper is one of those, it's one of those quals that puts you in a, you're now a sniper called Navy SEAL, which is just cool. And so the guy, you know, and guys don't pass it. And um, love sniper. I loved Atterbury. I loved the uh, yeah. Um, what did, who's that? What was that bar? Bucks bar down in down in. Oh, uh, I forget. I, I remember. God, we had we could all the deer we could eat. We, were you guys <laughs> go out and and hunting deer at the end of the day oh, yeah. for steaks and stuff? It was amazing. Yeah, it was a great course. And and just I like the uh, the open bay stuff and yeah. and everyone's there. And even you know the. Little things that I'm not, I'm sure are still there, but it was just a camaraderie where we went, okay, the shooting, the classroom stuff's done, the shooting's done, guns are away, let's go, the beer lamp's lit. And you go back there and you're just, you know, you're in a trailer just drinking with your buddies and it's, 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 it's a I mean, hard we, course, but a great course. We had the whole base to ourselves too. People don't understand, but uh, Atterbury is this base in uh, Indiana and it used to be a major hub during World War II for recruiting and training yeah. guys and then it's all but abandoned. So we had the whole place to ourselves. It was <laughs> we, awesome. It was, yeah, it was good. So really Bizek, good Bizek had you guys running because Dave Johnson was a runner. So we were averaging 30 miles a week with that guy. Oh, and wow. It was like, damn. Well, Bizek, see, Bizek was smart because he was really good at delegating. So he wouldn't, uh, <laughs> he would join us on a couple of them. Uh, but then he would, uh, he'd have some of the fast instructors do it. Uh, of course. And sometimes some of the students do it to tell us where to go. Almost like a budge run. Like keep running down the road until you run into the truck and then it's time to come back. <laughs> Good times. All right. I got it. We're, we're going to backtrack just a bit, but sure. can you give me a good um, Hell Week hallucination story? Because yes. these are some of the most entertaining I've heard. Yes. Some of them that I've heard are funnier than mine, but I went through uh, Hell Week with one of Admiral Smith's sons. So he was an ensign at the time. Yeah. And both his, his older brother and his father had been through Hell Week. And so he's just giving us advice that he had heard, not that he lived through. He said, when we're in Hell Week now, um, we're going to get tired and, and, and we're going to get to a point of, of hallucination where you're going to have extreme lows, but then you're going to have extreme highs. And when you're low, tell someone because maybe they're on a high and they can talk you off the ledge or, or you know, whatever. Um, but when you're high, make sure you tell us again, because maybe someone's low and you can talk them up. And we were doing, a, I think we were doing Around the World, which is yep. the Thursday night, God rowing, just yeah. you can see everything. Yep. That's where I had mine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because, you know, you've been awake for four days at this point. It's nighttime and, and whatever. And I looked, at, and you just see the weirdest stuff. But I looked up and I said to um, to, to Smith, um, is there an aircraft carrier in front of us? And he, and he said, no, there's not. I said, so I'm assuming that that's not a real dragon on the flight deck of that aircraft carrier. And he goes, yeah, there's none of that. I go, okay, I'm on an extreme high right now. So if anyone needs some, come get it. (laughs) I mean, it was so entertaining because for some reason, nobody has a hallucination at the same time. So everybody else, I had a guy in my raft. He got up to the front of the boat and thought he was Elvis. And then he (laughs) fell in and was screaming bloody murder. Cause the last thing you want to do on night four is get get wet. And, uh, I was convinced I'm, I was in the San Diego Bay around the world, same deal. And I swore to God, there were three 747s that were floating on the bay. And I was like, guys, we got to go help them out. We got to see if anybody's alive. Here. And like, they're like, oh, okay, sir. Yep. Yeah. yeah. yeah you're, having, you're having a good day or a bad day. <laughs> well, I, I had I'd heard a story about a guy before I got there that, uh, he, uh, he, he, he got afraid of his, uh, or he thought it was a snake <laughs> and so threw it in the water. And uh, the instructors were like, uh, why are you throwing your own in the water? You go get that. And, uh, he jumped in there freaking out. He yelled at hallucinating. And he grabbed the oar. And they go, why in the hell would you grab that snake in that war- water oh. full of sharks? It's like, <laughs> stop messing with the guy. The na- Mother Nature's doing it alone. For anybody who doesn't understand, uh, Hell Week, you're up for five days straight. 
maybe you get a combined total of 45 minutes. So about night number four, you're so strung out that that's the reason why you get a hallucinate without using drugs. Yeah, so that's true. Like, and, and, and the short term goals too. the advice I give people now is don't, don't concentrate on getting to Friday because you'll lose your mind. All you got to do, Hell Week ends at Wednesday morning when the sun comes up and it's over. You're good because yeah. you're, you're just going to keep going at that point. So yeah. just your long term goal <laughs> is Wednesday. Your short term goal is the next meal. Rob, you probably have a ton of guys that are coming to you and asking you for advice. What do you yeah. think? Hey, I want to get into the SEALs. What is the first question you ask these guys, these I ask wannabe them, candidates? They, they ask me what they should be doing to prepare. My question is, what are you doing to prepare? And a very common answer I get is I'm taking cold showers to get used to it. And I'll say, knock that off right now, and I'm going to tell you why. If I told you in 30 days I'm going to kick you in the nuts as hard as I can, and in order to get ready for it, you had your best friend kick you in the nuts every fucking day, guess what? It's still going to suck when I do it. So just... Take it when it comes. You're not going to get used to misery. Just take it. Absolutely. Now, growing up in a cold climate like Montana, or I grew up in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Okay, cold is the great equalizer, right? You can be, oh, yeah. you can oh, run yeah. four minute miles, you can throw cars around, but that's the one thing that kind of kicks everybody's ass. But that said, having grown up in Colorado, I didn't feel like it was as impactful, the I, cold, as it seemed to be for some of the other guys. I was just talking about this to a friend of mine. And I said, eventually, eventually it'll get to you. You stay in 57 degree water. You're going to start shaking after an hour or two, right? Mm -hmm. Two hours. But when I first got there and we did our first surf torture and we're sitting there in the water and dudes are just freaking out. It's like, this ain't, this isn't, this isn't that bad guys. Um, now granted they were, they got good. I mean, the instructors are very creative out there and they, they, they got us cold. I mean, you know, you fill a boat full of ice water and stick a guy in at the slushy for a long enough time. You're going to get oh, yeah. But no, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. I mean, it was bad. Don't get me wrong. Um, well, sure, it sucks. But I had a, I had a harder time with pull ups than I did with the cold. And that and that's advice I give kids now. It's like uh, run in shoes as long as you can. Don't run in boots and just yeah. do more pull ups. And they're like, well, how many pull ups should I be able to do? I'm like as many as you can. Well, how do I get better? You do more pull ups. That's keep it simple. That's yeah, it. I, had this, I had the same issue. And pull-ups is one of those things that you get better the more you do. It's pretty yeah, obvious. You, you so get stronger by doing pull-ups. Yeah, before training, I put a pull-up bar uh, in the doorway of my bedroom. So anytime yeah, I right went it. in or anytime I left, I had to crank out 10. Yeah. And it helps. But you can get yes. Oh, it helped me too. It helped me a ton. I built one in, in, in my, my house too, because I didn't know anything about pull-ups playing basketball. And I, I, I thought hey, pretty, pretty easy. I'm not got sets of 20. And I can do like two. It's like, okay, this is we need to work on this. <laughs> um, but that's, I mean, you just, you get better, you get better. And then, and then you start putting weights on yourself and heavier pull-ups and then doing, doing the pyramids. Um, and I just would recommend people don't worry about the cold, get better at pull-ups. And most things, a lot of things seals do, uh, revolve around this movement. Like yeah. we're going to go up this, we're going to climb down that. And, uh, yeah. So the, the pull-ups, yeah, cold sucked. Um, it didn't bother me getting tied up and thrown in the water, uh, just because, it's one of those things where if you can just if you can calm your mind, you're good. Don't don't stress about the nonsense. So I like I never freaked out being tied up. It's just the pull ups kicked my ass. I was in, I had that. I love how they call it remedial training, but it's just means <laughs> it's just remedial. No, it's not. You're just kicking my ass and embarrassing me. The circus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, um, circus and the goon squad. That's a yeah. Those are funny. Um, we talked about Shipley, and his big thing has been. Um, finding fake Navy SEALs and exposing them because I think he just really enjoys it. It's fun for him. Um, but the thing about SEALs, like you just said, the circus, most people wouldn't realize what you're saying. I'd say, you know, other stuff, you'd recognize it. But like we can call, we can call out a, a fake SEAL in no time. We had a, a dude um, up in Butte, Montana that went to Montana Tech when I was already at SEAL Team 2 and his name was Marshall. And uh, he met my sister and said, yeah, I'm a Navy SEAL. And she said, oh, my brother's a Navy SEAL. Naturally, we're both like, oh, I want to meet this fucking guy because one's lying, the other's lying. Well, all of a sudden, his eyes go like this. Oh. But 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 here's how it went. So we met at Maloney's Bar in Butte, Montana, over a beer. And I said, he goes, so you were a SEAL, huh? And I said, yeah. And he goes, what class? I said, 208. What about you? He goes, 161. I said, oh, Scott Neal was in 161. And he said, yeah, I know, Scott. I was in the Goon Squad with him. I'm like, all right, we're both legit. <laughs> Perfect. Yep. Problem solved. <laughs> yeah, we know we not enough get shit faced. Oh man, if I had a dollar, I spent some time out in uh, Los Angeles. If I had a dollar for every phony seal I bumped into out there, I would it's be retired right now. It's, it's just like, I mean, after a while, it just. Oh, I don't care anymore. 
<laughs> yeah, that's just it. When you're a young buck, you're full, you of, fight, full yeah. of full of vinegar. You want to prove something. Now it's just like, man, you just kind of you're yeah, disgracing why, yourself. Why are you lying about yourself? Be proud of something you did, not something you yeah, did. Yeah, well. there was a guy, there was a Vietnam sealer. I heard a story where he said, "Yeah, eighty. There were eighty guys that fought in Vietnam, and I've met all twenty two thousand of them." <laughs> That's about right, huh? That'll keep <laughs> yeah. Don. I'll keep Don Shipley busy for the next couple of decades. Oh yeah, he's not going to run out of work. <laughs> um, so you were talking about sort of right place, right time. I can't think of an individual in the teams that was more right place, right time. Was some of the? I mean, obviously, your op tempo at at Team Six. Yeah, it, 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 it was. was. Talk a little bit about the op tempo, and then I'd love to get into. Yeah. I, I guess what we'll refer as the highlights. I mean, sure. You were you were at Team Six for. How I, many I got there. I got there in March of 2004, and then so I got the Red Squadron at the, in 2005, well December 2004, and uh, and then we deployed in April to Afghanistan. My first trip to Afghanistan, and um, it was just we we went to one of our safe houses in Afghanistan, and and I learned by watching. We only had a couple dudes there, like we're we're, we're spread out, so we're talking three four guys taking down houses. Um, and just, it was good for me to watch the older, more experienced guys because, uh, you know, I'd never been there. So I'm assuming suicide bomber everywhere. Everyone's going to shoot at us. But it's like, that's not the case. Man. Just, right. And I, I remember watching these old, older guys and just thinking, you know what? I want to be cool like that. And that's just good training. I'll, I'll just pretend I'm that cool. But, but you know, we did, we, we were doing the, the, the four months on, four months off. And it got faster and faster into, um, we went to Iraq, to the surge and Afghanistan, all this stuff. But even that first one was was so that was 2005 obviously when operation red wings went down and we actually went and saw those dudes before uh turbine 33 was shot down at jalalabad airfield uh dan healy was on that bird i went to yep. sniper school with him yeah i, and remember, so I, remember, I remember him at two yeah and i was and he like the big he would only drink sam adams <laughs> like, yep. i just remember just a solid big, great big guy from new hampshire and um i saw jeff taylor you know jt and we just rolled over because um you know, we had our bikes and we heard there was team guys in town. So me and another dude took the book. This is Jalalabad when you can drive motorcycles down the street and whatever yeah. and bullshit with them and, and Latrell and those guys had already been inserted. Um, the, not the, you know, the, the team, the sniper team, the four guys. And um, we went back, I saw the guys and, and, you know, we're just like, Hey, have a, we actually asked if we could get on the bird with them when they do the hit, because they're going to go hit a Mod Shah's house in the, in the 47s. And our guy said, no, we, you guys got to stay off there. We've heard rumors of, uh, of um, missiles in the valley. Like they've got surface air missiles. So we're like, okay, well, that sucks. I mean, we'd love to get on there, but they ordered a stand down. So we went back to the safe house. And um, another one of my guys from Team 6 had flown in. So I took him there and, and we had some of our Heinekens. And even, you know, even though no one ever drinks overseas. <laughs> and, um, but then we got word that, um, hey, someone came out and said, dude, your boys just got fucked up. And we got to get up there. And we went and got read in. The turbine three three had been shot down. The, the snipers had been ambushed. They said um, we got to get someone to the crash site because we don't know if anyone survived. We think Axelson and Latrell are still alive. Um, we we got, we're, we're getting everybody, and and so we're not flying in because they're shooting shit down. So figure it out. And we were lucky to have a team from RRD, the Rangers uh, uh, Sniper Regiment. Um, a bunch there's Marines nearby. We, we grabbed all the Rangers we could, and that was just a that was just a cool spot to be an American. Cause like we went into a, a bee hut uh, to some Rangers and said, you know, we need like five volunteers and all 20 guys got out of bed and they said, you know, it should take us 10 minutes to get ready, but we'll be outside in five. Awesome. And so we kind of split up and um, everyone finds, find something, find a car, find a truck, find a Humvee. We're driving. And so we drove up there. We met up with some other government agency assets and they had some frigging donkeys and we're going to put our water, some of our gear on donkeys. And then we're going to hike up and, um, just a really long day. Uh, Afghanistan gets really hot too. And we're walking up the Afghan mountains, which is the Western Himalayas. So you can imagine how steep they are. Yeah. Um, we eventually had a team fly in, um, to get the crash site from, from our squadron. And, and then we went after Latrell. We're going up and down. That was actually the, we got in a gunfight with, um, some Taliban guys across a valley where we, we, it was the, the cloud cover got pretty low, so we couldn't get bombs. We had to try to get A 10s, and, and uh, I'd never seen A 10s before. And that's one where they, you know, it was a female pilot. She came in from one side, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously the gun that shoots 4,000 rounds a minute or whatever. And you could, the way she was so close to us shooting at these, where you could see the smoke coming out of the gun as she's firing, and you hear it go over your head, supersonic, and then you hear it hit, and then you hear it shoot. 
It's just yeah. so bizarre. It's like, mm, mm, wah. <laughs> and she flies off, and we're calling him in on these dudes. And uh, and I'm pretty sure when this um, this saying came up, because this Marine came up to me, and he goes, I guess it's true what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, except an A-10. An A-10 will fucking kill you. <laughs> and and uh, so, you know, we're going up and down, and, and uh, we went down to one of the other safe houses in Sadabad, got the note from Latrell that the, the guy brought out, and then had an argument with the with the local with our government agency because they you know they're so concerned about their sources they're like well this might not be him because he didn't cross the t's and we're like yeah but he got a social security number right it's him and then we walked back up and we had other rangers come in but we did get to a point up there where um it was so hot so miserable we'd been awake for two three days and um the seals that were there were like this this is why we have hell week this is why training so hard because if we wanted to quit right now where the fuck are we gonna go we're just here and then we, we were heading down the damn thing, and then Rangers did come in, and they they pulled them out, and then we got done and, and uh, went to a, uh, one of the one of our other houses that slept for like thirty hours. But I mean, that's just that's the first, and that's my first deployment. And then that was that was our part in, in the rescue of the trial. And and you know, that, but then you go back home, you see your kids again, you're trying to get a grow your big beard, and then boom, we're going to Iraq, yeah. and then we're coming back from that, and um, going back to Afghanistan, back to Iraq, and it just the tempo was so fast and so, so the way we had it set up was um you know you're deployed and then you're training and then you're standby then you're deployed so standby is when you're supposed to be home and i was my birthday 2009 and i was at my daughter's easter tea party at her preschool when i got a call that richard phillips had been taken by somali pirates you guys are going right now and i'm talking now like it's not like sit down kiss the kids like here's here's your easter treats i got for you i gotta get to work we're flying and um we had never done that in, 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 I mean, we'd never done a mission from soup to nuts as far as a hostage rescue. See, they'd done it before, but we've been selling for 25 years that we can be wheels up in four hours. Right. And we were wheels up in three hours and 59 minutes. Like, it's <laughs> like, like the, the CEOs back there, like, get the shoots on board, guys. I'm, this is yeah. my ass. Oh, I want, I, I want to pause you on that for a sec. I want to yeah. get into the Phillips, but I had a couple questions about Red Wings. Um, you know, it's a delicate subject ever to sort of Monday morning quarterback. Oh, what, I agree. What I agree. went down. Very delicate. They don't deserve that. I do have, no. I want to ask you a question, maybe an opinion. Yeah. Spent some time in Afghanistan. Uh, it's a nasty place. You were there multiple times. Do you ever go anywhere in Afghanistan with just four guys and not a QRF that's minutes, uh, minutes away or armor staged? It's, it's, see, it's, you know, it's again, risky, and, right? It's, it's really risky and it's, you know, we, we did some sniper work in Kosovo and one of the mm -hmm. hard lessons we learned is when you go in someone's backyard, you're probably going to get compromised. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how good you are at stalking. They've been there a long time and they're going to, they're going to spy you. Um, and I, I don't, I, I, I don't want to trample on anyone's graves and I was nope. not there. Um, I don't think the Vietnam era tactic of, of RNS needs to be used in that place. It, it may, I mean, it can work. I've seen it work, but it's just not, it's just not worth it. If, if you, we, you, you better have help right around the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and the, they sort of did. They had them right there, but we don't have comms. We can't get comms. Yeah. And, and, and the, first, the first thing you do when you get off a bird is make a comm check. And if you don't have it, you're done. We're out. I, I don't know, man. It's, it's, it's a, it's a really, it's, it's a, it's a very dark day in, especially in the teams in the special operations community yep. and in the country. And it's just, but I mean, had, well, I mean, look at us. If, if we would have got shot down, we'd have been lot. It's like, what a fucking stupid call that was flying in there. But what if they pulled it off? It's like, that's the most genius military shit. Hide in plain sight. I love it. Exactly. And, and again, I get, there's a difference between having maybe an opinion or having a judgment and I uh, appreciate your opinion on it. I really do. That is, um, and, you know, I knew, I knew those guys. I know yeah. Mark as well. And um, they fought their fucking asses off. And, and then and you get the, you know, you get the guys on, on Facebook with the bottle of booze next to them and they're just talking shit about, hey, it's like, you weren't there, man. So oh, yeah. I guarantee I knew Danny Dietz really well and Murphy's awesome. And, and um, Axelson and then Marcus, I, I know they fought their asses off and, 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 being in a gunfight, it, it, it can be scary, especially when you're outnumbered and they have the high ground. Like, it's a it's a motherfucker. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, anyone could have done it different. Well, it was just recently the anniversary of when those guys went down yeah. and we lost them. And so rest in peace, you guys. God bless yeah. them all. Yeah. Uh, and you know what I love about them, too, because we recently had Memorial Day, too. What I like to remind people 
is they never want you to mourn them. They want you to toast to them and have that three day weekend, but don't forget about them. Have a drink and we'll see them in Valhalla one day. Absolutely. I think I know the answer to this question. Helicopters, love them or hate them? I love helicopter pilots. Yeah. Um, I'm still, uh, they, just because of the way they can maneuver those, because I'm pretty sure through physics, hel helicopters aren't supposed to be able to fly. There, and there's too many moving parts. It's not supposed no, to work. Oh yeah. There's a lot of them. Um, the pilots are the best. I had a, I had a pilot, um, um, flew it for uh, task force 160th, uh, special operations air, best pilots in the world. The special coolest guys in the world too. Yeah. We had a dude, we were in a, one of those Chinooks with 47, the same, the, you know, turbine three, three was and extortion one seven was and proof that if you get hit with something, everyone on board dies. So it's spooky. And we were doing an insert in Iraq and we screwed something up because we ended up landing on top of, of, uh, of Al Qaeda. So I was one of the team leaders. I was one of the team leaders in the back looking out the, the window and there's another team leader up front and we see these, um, they look like footballs that are on fire going really fast and they're RPGs, right? Yeah. And, and then I hear a dishka, which is an anti-helicopter gun. I hear, choo, 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 choo. and I look up at my, the other team leader and I see, I, he comes over to ICS and said, is that a fucking dishka? And I, I said, yeah. And we're on a pro. So we're, we're committed. And the pilot knowing we couldn't do shit about it, except land and he could try to take off to calm us down. All he said was, it, all he said was, well, this is fucking bullshit. <laughs> and that was enough to calm us down. I'm like, yeah, it's bullshit. I'll put it on the ground. We're getting out of this thing. Oh, it's just such a vulnerable position to be in. You've got this gigantic yeah. target that's flaring. Yeah. So it's yeah. just creeping and no, I mean, along. When they're at altitude. It's just like, get me out of this thing. Yeah. They can go fast, but not on, not on an insert. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I've, we've had our lives saved a ton by pilots. I love pilots. They, the helos are, I mean, they're they're cool to be in. Like, sitting on the side of a little bird on final is like, man, chicks dig this. Like, yeah, but, that's that's Hollywood style right there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Some of them are just, I mean, it's, it, it, I don't know why, but, like, when we get up to five, 6,000 feet, I feel like, ugh, this is too high <laughs> to be in a helicopter. Oh, I just, I just wanted the hell out. But it was yeah. always good to see when they were picking your ass up. Oh, yes, yeah. they were good to have. It's like, good. oh, God bless you guys. But, yeah. Shout out to the folks at TF-160, Night Stalkers, the very best in the world. I mean, they basically advertise anywhere, any weather, plus or minus 30 seconds. That's, and, uh, and that's, a, that's a no shitter. They are, they are there, plus or minus 30. It's awesome. Yeah, I mean, they're awesome, and they do everything they can for us because they know if they go down, we'll do everything we can to go grab those guys. And oh, yeah. Them, well, so. they will too. And they don't, I mean, even though a lot of people know about them, they don't get enough credit at all. They, no, those no. guys, those are the true professionals. I tell people I was smart enough. I was hitting the, the top of where my smarts go, uh, I can carry a gun and a sledgehammer and I'm good. That's all I can know how to use this and how to use this. And I don't, I don't, I'm doing nothing else. But those guys are just, just the flight plan, flight lead, insert extract timeline. Um, and then the covering fire, you got like, either you got, you know, if you got Apache pilots, which are awesome or daps, which are awesome or Cobras. I mean, there was even rumors going around, uh, around parts of Afghanistan where they said, do not shoot at the skinny helicopter. Like it'll, it'll light the whole thing up. <laughs> And the coyote um, pilots, man, they're just so many cool, cool birds. Let's go and rewind, get back into, you get the call. Yeah. You're, you're damn neck. And they're like, Hey, this is happening. It's happening now. You got four hours before you're off. Yeah. Well, we, yeah, we had an hour to get to work and then we should have everything going. And the people who also don't get enough credit is the support guys. Yeah. Cause those parachutes were packed and ready. The, 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 the boats were rigged and ready. It's just a matter of getting them on the truck and putting them on the, on, and the, the damn truck drivers who got them to the birds to put them on and the riggers who rigged them down. Um, you know, we already had our bags packed, guns loaded, right? We had a zero 300 bag, all that stuff. Um, and we just had a timeline to get there, but load, but like the bus drivers were there and had the buses in the right spot. Here's the gear that you put into the, into the box trucks. And then we're going in and then, you know, taking off ideally four hours. But I mean, just, just the pilots that got us on target to the drop, it, it was it was a 15 hours and 46 minutes from the time we got the call to the time we had a full head count on all four boats in the Indian ocean, which is very impressive. And, and then uh, what we didn't have a plan. We didn't know what to do with a, a, a Navy destroyer towing a lifeboat. So we put, we just, it was never a three, two, one execute. Yeah. It was a put the snipers down you watch them now and make sure they're safe. Uh, nothing unsafe happens. And they just shot. 
when they saw something on all of them shot when something unsafe happened. And the cool thing is about that, you know, like I mentioned, we hadn't done this in over 25 years. And these guys were in their own beds four days prior. Their guns did not need to be sighted in. But they were. Yeah. And they, I, they took the shots on Easter. It's just awesome. Those snipers. I mean, the insert, describe the insert, because I can't think of another real world situation where that's been used. I mean, a lot of people that make the calls yay or nay on, on the op, on the plan are really scared to have people jump out of a plane because they're, oh, we, that's one more thing. We might worry about somebody getting hurt, but that wasn't the case for you guys. And no, with, with, clean, with, clean that up for me a little bit. If you well, with the, with the water jump, um, it, it's good because you can decide how much distance between you and the target. So, and I've always been a believer that the last thing you want to do is at night jump into the ocean. Because if you lose a guy at night, he's lost. You're never finding him. That's why I was always confused why the Navy went to blue camouflage. If you fall in the water, you want to, you don't want to blend in with it. I want an orange <laughs> thing with it, whatever. But uh, I was, I was the lead jumper for that, that mission. So my job is to jump out of the, the bird, pick up everybody, and then find our boats that we launched. But what, what um, and we, I mean, we've done these, these jumps a lot in practice off the yeah. coast of Virginia off the coast of North Carolina, but we never, and we, one of the training scars that I quickly realized in the air while I'm under canopy trying to lead these guys into the boats is when we jumped off the coast of the States, we always had safety boats and, and they'll be turning the circles and you can see them. They're marking the drop zone. When you jump into the Indian ocean, I couldn't find the boats. And, uh, and the reason was, is, is the sun was glaring right on them. And I didn't notice that. Yeah. But then just to cut like to the Al Mack thing with the, this is fucking bullshit. I just made a hard left turn knowing the entire staff would follow me. So they would think I knew what the fuck I was doing. <laughs> so you were faking it until you made it. Yeah. On real, I, I'm on trying to get a look. And, and uh, um, I remember I, the weirdest thing is I remember seeing a, a, a whale shark. Cause we, you know, we jumped at 5,500 feet. So we're down now two grand and I, that's not the boat. That's a whale shark. And then, Oh, there they are. Oh, perfect. And again, it's team guy luck. Yeah. I found them and then just I had enough time to do the downwind leg crosswind leg and then back up and then we, we were able to land on these boats and uh yeah it was just kind of funny and you know we did I could see the um we had a flat top out there an amphib ship the U.S.'s yeah. boxer so I could yeah. see that so it was like it wasn't all bad like we're not going to be lost at sea but if I'm going to lose my job if I can't find our boats no the boys are like good job Rob nailed it no, man. put I us right on there and you're, yeah. and you're like uh yep <laughs> we, we nailed it. We nailed it. Good, but we, 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 we've been doing a ton of jumps uh -huh. of training and I was lead jumper for a long time. And, and, and that's like doing night jumps on the mountains. So finding a drop zone under nods and all that stuff, I was very confident in jumping, but I couldn't find the boats. I'm like, well, we're just going to, at least I'm going to hit the ocean. <laughs> you know, we, we'll be in there. We will. But yeah, we found them all. We, and we brought a few extra jumpers because that's the first hostage rescue. So, you know, a lot of the head shit that didn't need to be on the jump, were on the jump to get the call. Of course. And, you know, well, and they'd be like, well, I got to set up a command post. Like, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Just get, get in the plane. <laughs> um, strap, yeah, the, strap the, hangers. The snipers went in there and, and they did their job. And then we got Richard Phillips and just an amazing time. And, um, but then another training scar we realized is that we'd been training so long and can we get there in an amount of time? No one ever thought of, okay, now how do we get them home? So we were stuck over there. We had, we, we had, all we had was what we jumped with in a waterproof bag and right. the camis we went in the water with, and they ended up driving us to Cutter. Yeah. Um, we got off at Camp Doha and we're living in this crap. So they gave us per diem to go to the crappy little uh, Arab store to buy the fake Oakleys and the sweatsuits and stuff. And we're just chilling on, uh, chilling on base where they send a lot of, uh, a lot of soldiers and airmen for R and R from the war in Iraq. So you can get, you can get beer there, but you only get like three a day. So then we figured out how to do psyops, how to trick army guys who didn't drink into borrowing their ID to get their three beers. And then like CID and NCIS started lying to the army saying that these are real agents just lying to you to get beer. And we're like, no, we're actually Navy SEALs and we're just trying to get beer because it's good. And it took it like a whole shit show that we didn't have time in the movie to put it in there. <laughs> in your uh, sweatsuit with your Oakleys. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Good look. Yeah. That's a good look, right? Strong. Good luck. Yeah. Like we're doing karaoke in, in, in tracksuits. <laughs> what uh what rifle did you use on that uh i what? i had my hk 416 okay and we were jumping uh um we just you know what we did yeah we know we had them in waterproof bags some so, long guns uh uh the snipers did i think they had four uh four seventies. right so they're shooting set. now that they, they might have five five six shit i don't know but you know it was a whole thing where most of the stuff's in the boat i'm just gonna carry my pistol and something in a small bag here and sure. if i live i'll just have a pistol if not i get my shit out of the boat 
Well, it was a solid execute fire, man. Uh, it it on, was. They did a great job. I mean, the leadership did a great job. The, the head shed did an awesome job. Just, uh, you know, getting the approval from powers that be and having us go on the call. It was, and it was just, uh, another mission where it could have gone sideways, but it went, it went well. Well, good on you, buddy. Uh, let's get into it. Uh, you've probably talked about this endlessly. Uh, so I'd love you to go ahead and lead the charge in whatever way you want to go. But uh, yeah, the Bin Laden raid, I mean. Yeah. And again, right place, right time. I mean, I was even before the Bin Laden raid, I was on the base when Bergdahl walked off and we tried to actually get him like 19 times. So it's just yeah. funny, right place, right time, the uh, Red Wings, Phillips, Bull Bergdahl, and then Bin Laden. It's like, I, I, I had you guys fuck with me. They said, uh, I think an army guy said, you're like the Forrest Gump of the Navy, except you're not. <laughs> <laughs> But he said you're you're not as good looking and you can't run as fast. Like fuck you, dude. What? <laughs> I mean, you kind of are though. You. So we went. Uh, so we went over to Afghanistan one more time, and I was I was a, a senior enlisted advisor for a, a couple different bases. And you know, we're getting to the point where it's like, how many more deployments do I do as a team leader, and then eventually go into training or whatever? Maybe go to Busby and instructor. We got back from um, we got back from that deployment, and we went on a dive trip to Miami. Nice. After some leave, uh, just to dive and have some good liberty. After war, you want to you want to unwind, and we got a call, um, and they they were bringing me and my number my number two guy, um, the troop commander, and another guy, and they flew us all up to um, Virginia Beach. They flew some other guys around in Vegas, Vegas on a climbing trip, yeah, um, yeah. back, and then they they put twenty eight of us in a room and said we found a thing, and this thing is in a house. This house is in a bowl in a country. You guys are gonna fly in there. And get this thing you're going to bring it back well quick question on that um so they didn't assign that to a squadron that was mounted up and ready that was sort of a hand-picked crew it was, is that accurate it, it was hand-picked from a squadron that is supposed to be leaving town every now and then on training okay so the thought is there's already a squadron deployed but if they stop doing missions someone might notice that they're training for something else and God bless them, because if I was deployed and they sent another team over to do the job I should have done, I, I would have I would have fucking shot somebody. Yeah. But they were nothing but nothing but professional, love nothing but love for them. And then the guys that were on standby, if they left town, everyone in Virginia Beach, Virginia Beach but the standby squad or just left. Because I mean, yeah, we don't advertise the nature of our work, but go to CP Shuckers and you tell me. <laughs> you know, it's like they're yeah. someone's talking. Yeah, where's so, everybody uh, at the duck in on a Friday? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> oh God bless the duck in, it's gone oh, now. The duck in. <laughs> another the, loss friday at the duck in man there was nothing like that it was epic you know I, oh. you just graduated buds you felt bulletproof and yes. there you are out there i haven't done all those push-ups for months and months and you, you just felt like we you were the, we you were the god of virginia <laughs> beach <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so we so we said uh, they said it's not a drill and um we said all right well what's the thing can't tell you where's the house can't tell you all right where's the bull can't tell you what country can't tell you how are we getting there can't tell you and they were like, well, what, how much air support? They said, none. Like, okay, good. There's an answer. And um, we had, we just assumed it would be Gaddafi in Libya because the, uh, the, the Arab Spring had just started up in Tunisia, spilled over to Egypt, back into um, Libya. And so we assumed we're going to go get him. I don't know why, but maybe we'll pull him out and he can debrief or some shit. I don't well, know. Let me, ask, let me ask you this, Rob, real quick. So you'd been at Dove Group for a while now. You've been at Six yeah. for a while. Yeah. And you probably have been spun up dozens of times for, all, for, all, for, all for it to be okay it was a nothing yeah. burger oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that happens and a so lot. is this is this another nothing burger or you're no, like no, no. no these they, guys are very serious when they when they had a cover story for us when we got there but they said this i assure you this is not a drill then they made some weird shit up that didn't make sense for us some top secret shit here and there but we just assumed we're going to go after Gaddafi. that's the, so because they wouldn't let us we're not bringing in the air force guys and they do our they do our, our, their masters of communication, masters yep. at, uh, at, 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 at surgery, basically medics. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're saying like, okay, if you have, if you've been to 18 Delta, you're carrying medical shit. If you know how to use a radio, you're carrying a radio, like old school team two shit. Yep. And as small as we can, and it's just seals on this one. And so we assume that's what it was. And, and we were getting our gear ready until Friday. And they said, all right, here's the deal. Go home, be with your kids, come in Sunday. This time we're going to drive to a place where the, the agency is going to read you in on what we're doing. So just enjoy your time with your kids. And, and I said, well, who's going to be at the raid in? And he's like, well, the secretary of the Navy, secretary of defense, probably the vice president. Blah, blah. It's like, the hell, man. And then they're going down the list and they said something, State Department, blah, 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 CTC pad, blah, blah, blah. And I caught CTC pad. That's CIA, counterterror, Pakistan, Afghanistan. So I'm like, well, if we're going to Libya, yeah. 
Anyway, so we went home. We came back on Sunday. This is a great story, a typical team guy story. We get in these vans. There's four of us per van, and we're driving uh, down, and, and we're in, my troop commander's in the back with me, and I said exactly what I just said to you, and I said, this isn't Gaddafi. This, this is Osama bin Laden. And my boss looked at me and he goes, that's exactly what I was thinking. And so we start yapping back and forth and the guy driving looked me in the rearview mirror in the eyes and he I swear to God, he goes, man, O'Neill, if we kill Osama bin Laden, I will suck your dick. Oh, oh buddy. But that got awkward in three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hear about that uh, on Fox no, News very often. No, no, no. That, I can't say that one on, on Fox. But uh, yeah, so we get... Um, we get down there and then you know we they, they locked the door and the team that found Bin Laden came in and said the reason you're here is it's the closest we've ever been to Osama Bin Laden. And so we, we're looking around and it's like, cool, we're going now. I'm ready. But they wanted us to train, not of for course. us to train. We got this, but they wanted us to look at the site, study it, come up with a plan, and then rehearse it so we can show people making the decision that we're one of your solid options. And Put them in a comfort zone. Yeah. Yeah. And even even after um President um, Obama said, uh, you know, I was never convinced Bin Laden was there, but after seeing you guys, I was convinced you could go in and find out and come back a lot. And so, and you know, we, couple different options and we actually got more airframes than we asked for. Um, we did get the helicopters that we didn't know about that, 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 that have stealth technology that, you know, we did crash one. So, you know, China got the technology. And then um, we had more 47s. We had other guys, the, the team that we actually went in to, um, to, the other squadron that we were taking the job they actually did the job of irf for us which right still man i would have been so pissed off if oh was you're over you're in place you're ready and this is what we and do they're, and they're sending and how the... do you tell people well wait a minute we're the best of the best but now why did you fly them in oh, the... it, it, that... oh god how they didn't how they still don't hate us it, it yeah. amazing i would hate them but even, even even that same squadron after the bin laden raid they were the ones that jumped in for jessica buchanan and that book, Mob Six, just came out. And that I remember watching that on ISR. And I'm thinking, why the fuck didn't we get that? I'm like, well, yeah, you're right. They, they really should get this one. Dude, you already had a full deck at this point. But, hey, I heard from some guys, and I've been dying to ask you this question. Some guys say that they were pretty convinced this was a suicide mission. We don't oh, I, think I, we're I, coming back. What Talk to me about that. You're, well, you're, in, we, you're we, inbound. You know, well, we, we talked about it before. Um when we're standing around the planning table and, you know, we'd start screwing around. I remember saying to my guys, look, man, we, we, th we got to take this serious. This is a, this is a one-way mission. Like we're, we're going to die. And, um, you know, we, we recognized that. And then we would talk about, and one of, one of the guys said, look, man, don't take this the wrong way. Cause I'm, I'm going, but I need to say it out loud. If we know we're going to die, why are we going? Right. And it's just a fair question around the table. And, um, what we came up with is we're not going after Osama bin Laden for the reward, which we're not getting anyway. We're not going for the fame. We're going after bin Laden for the single mom who dropped her kids off at elementary school on a Tuesday morning. And 45 minutes after that, she jumped to her death out of a skyscraper because that's a better alternative than whatever's going on inside. What hell at 2,500 degrees we'll never know about. And her last gesture of human decency was holding her skirt. So no one could see up her skirt as she murdered herself. She, she was never supposed to be in the fight, but we're, supposed to be in the fight for her we're going that's why we're going and um and we accepted that and 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 then that was it there's and what's, what was cool about knowing you're going to die is there's no point in being afraid right and so we flew in and 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 worrying about shit that your worrying cannot affect is wasting your energy so stop thinking about it. Uh, me worrying about a missile hitting us is it going to stop the missile it's going to hit us it's or beyond it's your not. control I remember looking at one of my boys. So I'm sitting next to Cairo, mm -hmm. the dog, and his book just came out, No Ordinary Dog, which I highly recommend. And I'm plugging all my boys' books, by the way. You like that? Good. Because I'm, I'm the only SEAL that's written a book, let's be honest. Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Uh, so much, uh, the uh, SEAL Survival Guide available on uh, audiobooks. There you go. That's Barnes awesome. Too. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, someone said to me, you know, seals don't advertise and they start, uh, they, they don't they don't tell their stories. I'm like, yeah, I know I read that in about 90 seal books. <laughs> but I got Cairo here. I looked over and one of my guys is he, he had it, he put his his ear his earbuds in. He was asleep, right? And I look at him, I'm like, you are asleep on the ride to Osama bin Laden's house, but you have ice in your veins. That's awesome. And I was just counting, you know, as a sniper, counting from zero to a thousand, thousand to zero, count, just counting, keeping my mind off of whatever. 
thinking about whatever. And then we back to the South and I don't know how I remember it. I could just hear it in my head. I said, uh, I was like 556, 557. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward and freedom will be defended. And I could hear it. It was George Bush said that in 9-11. I don't know how I remember that. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward and freedom will be defended. And then it's kind of sinks in. I'm on this mission, man. Holy shit, we're going to kill this fucker. And then we back again. And then the crewman opens the door at two minutes. And we look down. And this is not a war zone now. This is a city with electricity and a fucking golf course. And uh, we're flying in. And I remember kind of laughing and thinking, this is some serious Navy SEAL shit we're about to do. <laughs> like, this is awesome. Um, and then all hell went. All it, it, The perfect plan exists when you're planning. The worst thing that can happen will happen. Murphy's going to show up. Oh, yeah. You know, worlds of combat, anything you do in combat can get you killed, including nothing. So the pilot didn't crash, but he did crash land in order to. He said if he would have powered up, it would have rolled. And he just knew that as a TF-160 guy in that a blink of an eye. If I turn here, pin the tail on that part, I can hit the I can hit the nose and everyone will live. And they did. Yeah. But we didn't know they crashed. So they put us down outside. We were going to put my guys, um, you know, interpreter dog, dog handler, sniper and a saw gunner and maybe another sniper. And then we're going to put my team on the roof because the other guys are going to fast rope. We're going to hit the roof and we're going to get him like that. He should be on the third floor, but they, he went up and went right back down. I didn't know what happened. I didn't know the other helicopter crashed, but they let us. And it's just like, all right, fuck it. We'll start it from here. Yeah. So I got out. I remember, I, I remember looking at the house in front. There's been Laden's house. I know there's a door right there that we can blow and we'll, on, we'll be on that side of the yard. The breacher went up and he put up seven foot charge of C6. And we're with guys now that don't need to be told that just he's going to do it. Seven foot charge of C6, blast the door, and there's a brick wall behind it. The door did open like a tin can, but there's a brick wall. So you're not getting in. And he looked back and went, failed breach. This is bad. And I said, no, this is good. That's a fake door. Nobody does this. He's in there. So we didn't know the um, the helo crashed, and we knew the carport was right there, that we had been, we'd seen it open and closed for cars. So I said, all right. Uh, dash one, we're going to, we're going to blow the carport. And he said, no, don't, don't blow it. We're going to open it. And see what they said at first that we heard was dash one going around dash one going around. But what he was saying was dash one going down. Right. So the, I didn't know they crashed, but the door opened and the thumb came out with the glove. I recognized now I'm like, all right, it doesn't matter how they got there. I don't need to know that they're just there. It doesn't matter how you got here in life. You're just there. Move forward. We can talk about it later. And like I tell football teams when I talk to them, it doesn't matter why it's second and 15, who missed a blocking assignment. It just is. Now let's move on. And we'll talk about that later. Well, this so, is another great example real quick for, for folks who haven't been in the military and familiar with the training. Some people think, oh, okay, so Rob O'Neill was designated as the guy oh, who's no, going no. to shoot Bin Laden. No, you just oh. described perfectly you had been training. You came up with the mission. You rehearsed the hell out of it. We'll be here. We'll be here. And that all went out the window. And so that's when the broader training experience kicks in because all of a sudden you're like, okay, we're going to have to adapt. And, and every all that training, all those rehearsals, gone, the done. First, the first time I stepped into a kill house at SEAL Team 2, up to the time I was at SEAL Team 6, all that training mattered. Everything we did, train like they'd always said, train like you fight, and we always made a joke. Oh, train like you train, and now it matters. Yep. And um, what we were good at, the reason we could keep moving, is because um, no one panicked, and we all could effectively communicate just by reading. So I knew that I'm going in. I'm, I was going to be on the roof. Now I'm going through the front door, and because I'm so far back, I have a front row seat. You know, I'm obviously uh, analyzing stuff, but now I'm just watching my guys. I'm watching cool guys do cool shit. And no one's panicking. And the training was there. Slow is smooth. Smooth is fast. The house should blow up. But if it does, it's not my problem anymore. So I'm just going to do my job. And uh, they, you know, they, well, I was in a, you know, you never get in a hallway, obviously, in a gunfight. You want to be in the room because the bullets will fly on the hall. And there's a guy in there already. And he whispered to me, helicopter crashed. And I didn't know. And I'm like, oh, my God. What helicopter crashed? Because we had, we had 47s behind us. Right. And I, they weren't stealth. So I assumed they got shot down on the border. So we just lost. 30 or 40 of my friends. And he goes, bro, our helicopter crashed in the front yard. Like he walked right past us. And I said, Oh, okay. I guess I was looking that way or something. And then as we're talking, the part where the, the helo tail was over the fence, the sniper was running past because he's doing a loop, a lap with Cairo and the handler. And he came over, he didn't know it crashed. 
And he said, um, guys inside, you got to be on alert. They are definitely ready for us. They have a training mock-up of our super secret helicopter in the <laughs> free yard. Right? So, so the boss came over and he goes, um, no jackass, that's ours. We crashed. And the, there's a pause and the, the sniper goes, yeah, it's a lot more sense than the shit I was just saying. <laughs> Carry on. Right? <laughs> and that's typical Navy SEAL banter, as you know. Well, like, pe- like People don't people appreciate don't the, 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 movies, organic, the organic comedy that yeah. comes out oh, yeah. of these situations. Yeah. They, they wouldn't yeah. believe it. They'd be like, what, no. what are you talking? No, I'm laughing no, they, in the middle of this. Yeah, a very guy. serious situation. Yeah. And it's, it's like, uh, um, this is the, what we're talking about. And then um, there's a barricaded door at the end, and the woman that found in line said, "You're going to, um, you're going to run in. I don't know where the stairs are, but you're going to run into Khalid bin Laden on those stairs. He'll will, he will be armed, and if you can get him, if you can take care of him, you get a shot at the big guy. And that's how she told us. And we ran into Khalid on the stairs. He was there, and the point man took care of him. I was like seven guys back, and we went up the the, the, the train went up the stairs, which is you know obviously the line." of guys and uh, I'm seven or eight guys back. And once we got to the second floor, everyone, but the point man, as you know, starts splitting off to clear the, you don't want to move up until we clear. And so I become the two man. I'm the last guy and I'm not going to leave the one man pointing there. So I put my hand on the, on the one man and, I'm, and, and just for people watching and listening is, is my job is to be his eyes in his, in his back. He's going to be looking forward with his gun always. And uh, as soon as I have enough guys and I want four, because we're going up this through a curtain. Mm-hmm. I want four, but I'll take two because yeah. uh, he's if he's up there, he's in that room. And the point man saw people moving behind this curtain hanging at the top of the stairs. And instead of a door, it was a curtain. And um, he just started saying, hey, we, let's do this, man. We got to go. We got Because he knows they're suicide bombers. But if we go, we can we might beat him. And uh, he would just he knew it was one of his guys. He didn't know it was me. And it was more of a we're not getting more guys. We're spread too thin. And I'm tired. of th- It wasn't bravery on my part by any means. It was. I'm tired of thinking about it. Let's just get it over with. I squeeze him. He goes up and moves the curtain. Here's the people he assume were suicide bombers. So he kind of pushes him and shoves him down the hallway. And he's absorbing the blast for the guy behind him, which is amazing, right? Mm -hmm. And because he went this way, I turn this way. And there's Osama bin Laden standing there. And he's got his hands on his wife's shoulder, who's about, you know, what, five, six, five, five. And he's six, four. And it, it went through my mind so quick was that dude's taller than I thought, a lot skinnier than I thought he'd be. His beard is shorter than, this is all that fast. Gray, shorter beard, but that's his nose. I've seen that on target so many times. He's not surrendering. He's a suicide bomber, very high threat. So I shot him twice, shot him again, moved her. And uh, you can just sort of feel who's going to be bad. He's taking his last breath and I push her onto the bed. And then as a father, his two-year-old or three-year-old son was standing there. And I was thinking, man, this poor kid has got nothing to do with this. And we picked him up. Other SEALs are coming in the room. I can hear him, Bin Laden's last exhale, his tongue sticking out. And uh, I'm standing and kind of now it's, everything speeds back up to normal. That was slow. Now it's normal. And I'm speeding. And one of my boys who comes in the room because we're going to start sensitive site exploitation, he comes up to me and he, he goes, are you good? And I said, no. Um, what do we do now? And he said, now we, now we find the computers. We find the intel. We do this every night. We've been doing this for years, hundreds and hundreds of times. And I said, yeah, you're right. I'm back. I know what I'm doing. And, and he, I get, I went, holy shit. And he goes, yeah, you just killed Osama bin Laden. Your life just changed. Let's get to fucking work. I mean, that quick. It's out, so awesome. And so we did. And um, we, we found three offices downstairs. There was some stuff in his bedroom. Um, I wish we had more time there because I don't know what we could have missed. But we filled bags with everything, put him in a body bag, carried him out. And I, have, I was one of the four guys that carried bin Laden down the stairs. And it's such a small community. We we put his body at the uh, at the feet of the sniper who initiated the fire on the Captain Phillips rescue. Like this is awesome. Yeah, and uh, he looks down the sniper and he goes, he goes, "You're shitting me." And we're like, "No, we're good." And he goes, "Let's get the fuck out of here." So, oh hell yeah! So we called in uh, the the EOD. Well, we'd have one EOD guy there. Sorry, I didn't recognize him at the beginning. Explosive orders disposal stud. Um, uh, the EOD guy and one of our breachers was rigging the bird. They blew it up. We went out. Um, now we got team guys trying to call in a 47 IRF and we're kind of really respecting the air force right now. Cause we know how to do it, but we love it when he does it. Cause he's really good. We called in the 47 and we got in and then we, uh, the, the other team took our original bird with the body. They're going to fly him up to refuel with the, the other 47. That's got the, the big fuel balls. And we get in this blue teams in there. 
Uh, so it's kind of cool to think SEAL Team 6 rescued SEAL Team 6. <laughs> and then we fly out. Uh, I'm sitting next to another SEAL named Rob. I know he's from he's from Manhattan. So 9-11 really affected him. And, and he asked what every team guy asked. I'm sure you asked, who got him? And I said, uh, I, I, I did. And he said, on behalf of my family, thank you, awesome. which really hit me hard. Now we're flying out, and we have 90 minutes to fly across the border of Pakistan. And if, if on a mission, we shouldn't survive. But if we can live for 90 minutes, we can live for 50 years. I get to see my daughters. But worrying about a missile is not going to help. So I just start to watch. And we're just, we're just, uh, just sitting there and um, counting, you know, watching it. Just, I, no one's talking. It's still loud in the bird, but we could scream if we wanted to. So, but it's been 10 minutes, all right? Now it's been 20 minutes. It's been 30 minutes. It's been 40 minutes. It's been 50 minutes, right? Then you start thinking of like, what, like when you're watching a no-hitter, like up to the top of the seventh, and you're thinking, I'm not saying anything. Yeah. I don't want to jinx it. 60 minutes, 70 minutes, 80 minutes. And then I love the sports analogy. You start thinking of like miracle on ice when the Americans beat the Russians in hockey at Lake Placid in 1980. It's like you can hear the crowd counting down a game they're supposed to lose and they're winning. It's 10, 9. We can still screw this up. I'm so nervous. 6, 5. And all of a sudden, again, how cool the pilots are. The pilot at 85 minutes came over the radio and said, all right, gentlemen, for the first time in your lives, you're going to be happy to hear this. Welcome to Afghanistan. <laughs> like, right. <yeah. laughs> so we landed and um, – the other guys, the other team had fueled up and they landed and everyone got out and were looking at each other and they pulled Bin Laden's body out. And I walked over and I, and everyone kind of knew what happened at this point. I remember McRaven came up, Admiral McRaven, sure. who just looks like an admiral, tall, deep voice, stoic. And make he, your he, bed. He, make your bed. Best speech ever given. I was so, team guy jealousy. I was so jealous. I didn't write that speech. <laughs> right. uh, he put his hand on my neck like this. It was just so awesome the way he did that. We're looking at Bin Laden. And then, um, the coolest part of the story, the reason that Zero Dark Thirty is not a great movie, it's just a good movie, sure. is um, at the end, they brought the woman that found Bin Laden over to his body. And she got emotional and cried and left. That's not what happened because she doesn't, I don't think she even cried when she was a baby, just the toughest woman in the world, toughest person probably. Um, the point man and I, the guy who led me up the stairs, we talked about what went down. Like, holy shit, what just happened on that stairwell? And then he goes, well, there she is, and you you own this, so give her something. I was like, yeah, you're right. And I walked over, I pulled the magazine out, and jacked the last round out. And I said, you have room for this in your backpack? Said, yeah, I think I do. And then we said, well, we have something to show you. And so, th and so we start to realize that this woman had given up her life to find him. Mm -hmm. So she didn't have a husband. She didn't have kids. And she'd been working 20-hour days for her however long and now he's here and then again uh being an arrogant navy seal i started thinking well shit i, I got a lot of pressure on me because i got to say something cool like in the movie we're a seal team we're here to get you out by the way you're welcome what do i say <laughs> this is historic this is going to be in the books and she found him shit and we got over to his body and i, I thought this would have been good enough i looked down and i said is that your guy and she looked down for a second and went well, I guess I'm out of a fucking job. <laughs> How cool is that? That's about as cool as it gets given the situation. I know. That was honestly. awesome. So like, all right. Next bad guy. Yeah. When I, get, I guess I found out if I get a parking spot because I'm not expecting a medal for this. <laughs> oh, buddy. Uh, I mean, phenomenal. And, and what a really cool sort of different angle than than what people have maybe heard or read about. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I, and I, just, I mean, the whole team, I, I hope everybody, I mean, I know – you, you know, guys, like me and another guy that wrote a book, you get a little shit for writing, but I hope everyone on that mission, including the pilots, tells their story because it's, it's just America. It's just it's just the Western civilization of what we can do. It's so awesome. Okay, so President Obama, I was over in Afghanistan with the agency uh, at the time, and we got the word, and we were just – we were going nuts and celebrating you guys. Uh, and then uh, our president, President Obama at the time, comes down and, and makes a uh, – basically a statement and all but says uh, – Hey, uh, SEAL Team 6 is no longer a secret anymore. What, what was your reaction to the president, how he handled that? And then after that, you had already touched on a little bit earlier, but, you know, life after the teams, you know, and some of the, God bless, I love my Navy SEAL brothers, but some of them are just I know, angry I know, I know haters. Angry. haters. And it's unfortunate. I mean, there is life after the teams for some of us and the choices <laughs> that we make. If I was 
doing porno with my dress whites on and a trident on my forehead, I could understand some, yeah, of, the, I know, I know. some of the blowback and why they might be hating. But uh, again, there's a couple questions in there if you want to dig in. Yeah, it's it's uh, and I explain this to guys now. I've actually got a foundation called the Special Oper- Special Operators Transition Foundation that helps special operators uh, get jobs because the Navy is the best thing. The Brotherhood, along with the Brotherhood, is the best thing, but it ends. And and you know you retire or whatever you get out or retire at forty. You got to keep the lights on. The Navy's not helping anymore, and you got to keep the mortgage paid. And there's nothing wrong with your resume, as long as you do it the right way. Just make sure you're not giving up tactics. And 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 like in my case, I wrote a book. It was approved by the Pentagon. One of my one of my brothers wrote one that wasn't. Um, and it's just do it the right way. And and the the, uh, the the haters, I don't know. I don't know what it is. And they they just they they can't get away from it. A lot of them come around though. And and I you know I'll, I'll welcome anyone with open arms. And, and, you know, I know guys right now that, that will never say a word and they will be happy to, to, to go get a, a security job, whatever they do, and, and, and not talk. But the hate, um, it's hard to get used to. And, and believe me, I know that you have been through it. Um, it's hard to get used to at first, but negativity like that is just fucking forget about it. And one of my favorite sayings is what you think of me is none of my business. So, so it's like and it, it, negativity will get you nowhere. But positivity, positivity will get you where you need to go. And that's just, it sucks, but they do. And I saw, I saw, I saw hate with that sniper that shot the shots. I mean, they were trying to fire him from the command a week when we got home. It's it's like, what, why? Yeah. It's well, I mean, it used to bother me because, you know, again, the, the the experience in the SEAL teams was an amazing, amazing chapter, but it's a chapter. It's a chapter. Yeah. Yeah. And so after a while, I was sort of like, okay, I, I'm, I did a TV show where I'm trying to help people survive situations. I wrote a book to try and help people in life threatening situations. If you're going to hate on that, I don't know what to tell you, buddy. I think, <laughs> and I think that you were one of the, like the, you were the trailblazer for dealing with hate. Cause that was, that was before me and then before a couple other guys. It's just, and it's, it's unknown, man. It's, it, it, you don't know how to react. And then it's like, well, what the, why would you say that? Like survival? Come on. You're helping. Yeah. Again, if I was doing pornos with, with my, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I get it. You're like, yeah, you're a disgrace to the team. Yeah, but yeah. I, you know, I spent half my life learning how to make people go away. Now I'm spending the second half trying yeah. to help people yeah. stick around. That's exactly right. It yeah. is what it is. Well, and, and like I, I, I'm, well, I got shit that said, why, why are you calling yourself the operator? I'm like, no, no, this is a story about the life of the operator. This is, this is every one of us. This is the Marine that went through the sand fleas in, uh, in, in, in Paris Island. This is for the guy that made it through butts. This is for the, the fat guy. <laughs> that couldn't swim that was in bin laden's bedroom because of the american dream the operator can do anything that he wants that, that that's what it is i mean like what is like steve drum used to say um i could be on the cover of decent shape magazine <laughs> it's like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but it's just a story about it's you know it's attitude is everything and you can do anything you want it's, i mean it's a, it's yeah. a it's a it's just kind of lessons learned so i don't know if pe- people hate don't 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 lower yourself into their level just stay no. above no, jealousy is a nasty thing, and it is what it is. But, Rob, Rob if you could have a 30-second conversation with a 21-year-old Rob O'Neill, what, what would that conversation be like? Uh, I, you know, I, again, I would, do, uh, I would do the pull-up thing. I always do pull-ups. Um, uh, avoid the negativity. Um, uh, gee, I mean, you're not indestructible. When you get 44, you're going to have stuff that hurts, so be careful what you do with yourself uh, now. True enough. Do you have some st- – have you had some stuff from uh, your time on active duty that you've had to get done? Hopefully you documented it. You're a sharp guy. I'm sure you did. Yeah, yeah. Everything Veter- that Veterans that. Choice has been amazing. I've got two new shoulders and a new knee. Oh, I good. Didn't, I didn't pay a dime for Good. No, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, yes, you know, stretch more and yeah. um, keep a better journal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What yeah. Um, What's next for you, Rob? What's in your bucket list at this point in your life well you i'm actually working surprisingly enough on i just partnered with a beer company called seawolf nice. brewery and we're working on a brewery to, to uh to put this stuff out I, uh, my first beer is called uh not available yet but it's called uh special hops dude that's thought- that's a good way to live so for anybody out there that's hating rob served his country for over 16 years and now he's serving craft beer what yeah. is wrong with that i'm here i'm here for you america <laughs> you're saving, you're saving lives too if this stuff's yeah. good liberty deserves a great beer <laughs> <laughs> buddy what is the story with your redskins this season what do you think and well, how does a guy from butte end up becoming well, no, a that's, redskin that's, fan that i can't even explain i think it has something to do with joe theisman i don't know for sure but i've always just loved the redskins um uh, 
I think they're going to have a great defense if this story ever happened, if this season ever happens. Um, the my biggest concern right now is is um, is with all the political correctness going on. I think they're going to yeah. force them to change the name. And and for me, I mean, okay, Redskins, it's you know, it's derogatory, but for me, it's it's honoring uh, the Warriors that, that 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 the Native Americans were. I mean, we were Red Squadron, um, and we even the call sign, the pro word for Bin Laden was Geronimo. We would never just disrespect Geronimo by naming him that. But you know the, how the pro words work. When we say Judy, it means we're at the front gate. When we say this, it means we're on the stairs. When we say Geronimo, it means we're at Bin Laden. That's all it meant. It was, it was nothing but respect for the war. Oh, did something get kicked back on that? Yeah, they said, how could you disrespect the Native Americans by naming Bin Laden Geronimo? Ger no, Bin Laden was named Cake Bread. So the wine can oh. be pissed up if they want to, but he was not named Geronimo, never was. But I've always loved him. Buddy, every, everybody's so damn sensitive right now. Oh, man, now. I, I wish we could get back to the days of sarcasm and irony and just jokes. Even the silly jokes like, you know, you trust me with your life, but not your money or your wife. Very it's true. Just, it's, it, it Very true. Out, it be true yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's just, uh, it, I mean, now it's you're going to offend some somebody by saying anything. I even enjoy, uh, I get in trouble for Twitter, but I enjoy saying something just to see like i can talk about the the snowfall in montana within three comments they're arguing about trump and biden i know dude what do you think what, what's what's your opinion on social media um i use it as entertainment alone and okay. i and, and i just i'll say something fucked up just to see how they react and it gets me in trouble sometimes but whatever i mean life's too short and i think that's just the i think that it's when you meet, I, I, I used to travel quite a bit. I'm starting to get back into it. I get to talk to so many people face to face. People are inherently good. They just, the keyboard warriors in us, yeah. whatever. It's like, we're, we're at a place now where you can say stuff without repercussions. Um, and that, you know, like we're learning now with all the looting and rioting that an ass whooping is better than a timeout. Yeah. Well, the digital courage thing is, eh, it, again, it's, it's right up there with don't waste your time to waste your energy. Don't waste your time. And, yeah. And, and don't, you know, don't read the comments until you're prepared to have someone say the nastiest shit about you. But, <laughs> In defense of some Twitter haters, they're worse on Twitter than Instagram, but in defense of, of some Twitter haters, they're pretty clever and a lot of humor on there that I like because it's they're saying stuff to me, but it's kind of funny. So whatever. Have you found yourself getting egged into a conversation or a debate uh, on, no, on social? Or are you like, no, I know what's going on here. I'm not gonna oh, I, I'm not gonna take the into, bait. I won't I don't get into a fight, but what I do is retweet them with their comment and say something cute to see how long it takes my Twitter followers to destroy them into deleting <laughs> the delegation I, I, social I've media very, delegation loyal followers that's awesome any regrets rob yeah um i had i was at my friend rob reeves house um a few nights before he, he went to afghanistan and was inevitably shot down on uh, extortion 17 and he asked me he pulled out a bottle of wine and he said did you want a glass of wine and i said no i don't know why i didn't want a glass of wine with him and he just, he had his own glass of wine. He said, you know, one of us, one of us, one of these days, I mean, I, one of these days, a lot of us are going to get killed on one of those helicopters, is what he said. Yeah. And I sat with him. So, and my regret is I didn't have a glass of wine with him. So that's, that, that's the one that comes out. Well, everything, everything else, fuck it. Learn from it. Move the fuck fucking on. Fucking helicopters. They my, suck, my, but they're a necessity, man. For people is whatever it is, get over it. Awesome. Um, Rob, I want to officially invite you out for elk hunting season this fall in Colorado, buddy. We'll chat about it, but there's Welcome an official to invitation. And if nothing else, I'll get out there and we'll just drink some craft beer. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> we'll do both. Buddy, I can't thank you enough for your time. I know what you make an hour on the speaking circuit. So thank you again for your time. That's awesome. Uh, I, I got to hear some stuff that I, I didn't know anything about from somebody who was there. And uh, cool, I, I, awesome. I know my entire audience appreciates you. Uh, God bless you, bud. Thanks for what you've done. Thanks for what yeah. you continue to do. I appreciate your time. Folks, um, if you have somebody, coworker, family member, friend that you care about, spread the word on this because our mission is to save lives. It's as simple as that. Um, please subscribe and listen for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get yours so you can be a survivor, not a statistic. Rob O'Neill, God bless you, buddy. Thank you. Yeah, buddy. Thank you. Can You Survive This Podcast is a Cavalry Audio production recorded live from The Bunker in Denver, Colorado. Hosted by me, Kate Courtley. Produced by Brandon Morgan and Kate Courtley. Associate producer is Jeff Apple. 
executive produced by Keegan Rosenberger and Dana Brunetti. Service, commitment, and integrity are the traits embodied by our nation's defenders, veterans, and first responders, and they are also the core values upon which the Gary Sinise Foundation is built. The Gary Sinise Foundation serves and honors our nation's defenders, veterans, first responders, their families, and those in need. Whether the Gary Sinise Foundation is providing specially adapted smart homes to severely wounded heroes, supporting Gold Star families, or providing essential equipment, training, and PPE to first responders, in all of the Foundation's programs, they honor those who so bravely defend our freedoms every day. Support our heroes today at GarySiniseFoundation.org.